Dallas Fellowship Church. It's a cold morning, but we've got warm hearts, right? And uh, we're glad to see you here, and thank you for making it out this way. When you're getting in and out of the parking lot, be very careful. Um, so it's kind of slick out there, and I parked up a hill a little bit so that I can just slide backwards and get in the alley and get out. That's, how, that's what I'm hoping is going to happen. If not, uh, don't leave without me. <laughs> okay. Uh, we're glad to be here this morning, and this morning the message is about a new thing. A new thing that God wants to do in you. God wants to do a new thing in you and a new thing in me. And this is out of Isaiah chapter 43. The key verse is verse 19. And before we get started here, I um, want you all to know that his ways are not our ways. Thank goodness, right? He's got a better plan always. And uh, he has things that you and I can do to be productive and get out of our stuck in the rut patterns that we might be in. God has a way to help us to find direction and goals that we may not be finding ourselves. He causes us to be able to know how to prioritize our lives. God loves us that much. It's almost like having a, a one of those GPSs uh, but it's right in our hearts and right in our minds and it's right from God. Now my GPS messes up every once in a while. I have to tell you, one day it did it to Carlene's phone as well as mine. We were driving to the uh, James Center and we were just making sure, because we like the GPS because it, it tells you when there's traffic problems and so on. All of a sudden it's taking us another way. I said, there must be some accident up there or something that's moving us around from the main highway. No, it was avoiding all main highways. And, and so it was really a scenic crowd that was trying to take us down. So we caught up back with the main highway. I said, Carly, get on yours. It was doing the same thing to hers. So the fact is, is sometimes what you think is the best thing may not always be the best thing. God knows. God knows that the new thing we need in our life is going to involve him. It's going to involve God. So we'll get back to that in Isaiah chapter 43. And the key verse is verse 19. And uh, you'll know, notice that I mentioned that in a message a couple weeks ago. We didn't have our service last Sunday because of the bad, bad weather. And it was even dangerous to get over here to do the videotaping for just online services. And we didn't. But uh, don't, I don't want to get, get anybody hurt. By the way, if you feel like it's too slick for you or you can't trust yourself on icy or snowy situations, use your best judgment. There's a no way that I would want you to get hurt on my account. But uh, to try to make it to church where we could make it, God's word says we should do that because God says, don't forsake the assembling of yourself together as the manner of some is. Some will forsake the opportunity and the ability to get here. And God does not like that. He wants us to be here. Why? For the fellowship of the spirit. That we can have that fellowship together. And it's kind of hard to have that fellowship with a TV set. So, it's great though when we can have that fellowship one-on-one -on -one when we can. Let's take advantage of it. Now, Carlene, come on up. Carlene had her uh, PET scan and she had the results from that. Echocardiogram was really good. She's got a good heart. You knew that already, didn't you? But she's got a good heart physically and internally, uh, spiritually. Uh, but uh, she did find out some pretty rough news that the uh, cancer has gone to the bone. As mastized, uh, mastized into the bone and now it's not only in the uh, muscle cavity uh, or muscle area behind the breast cavity it's in a lymph node there and it moved from the lymph node traveled to the hip area so it's already got a couple of, looks like at least one good hole there but not a good hole at all but anyway it's uh, several possible holes one for sure and then one in the sternum and so it's got those two places and it's also working right here. So uh, just keep on praying for Carlene. We're looking and checking out our options right now. There are other places. Uh, James Center is really good. Uh, but people have checked and told me that possibly we could look around and find uh, ways that they can give longevity in this situation. That's what we're looking for. I want to keep her around as long as I can. I want you to be stuck with me as long as possible, right? Okay, so maybe we're going to sing a song right now, and uh, she, if you see her getting a little bit gimpy, don't feel bad about coming over and getting her hand or her you know, arm and helping her out a little bit, okay, because that hip is hurting. She thought it was sciatic nerve pain. It was not. It was cancer. So 
There you go. And so you just continue to pray for her and for me. Uh, she's at my mercy. I miss her mom right now. Let me tell you, because I've taken care of the grandchild as much as I can. And, um, and of course, we're going to be gone quite a bit back and forth. And she's also at my mercy for food. The neighbor knows me. And he brought over a couple meals for us already. <laughs> so Mike Spencer, a good neighbor, he's also a preacher. And uh, so you just uh, keep us in mind as you're thinking about us and uh, laundry and everything. I'm trying to do what I can. Hey, you know what? I've got more thankfulness and more appreciation for women in the household than I've ever had before. I want you to know that you, you girls have a tough job to hoe. And I want you to know that the very fact that some of you have worked in the workplace and then come home and can still do work at home, it amazes me. Because it just wears me out. I'm telling you, try to keep up with things. Especially when you got the little one running around, you know. And, but the fact is, is that God's taking care of things. He will continue to. I believe God is greater than this. I believe He is. And I believe He can take care of my wife. My lovely wife, Carleen. So, we're going to sing a song for you. And we're going to do everything we can for as long as we can. And, uh, and I believe that God has a way and a plan. Okay? So just keep praying for us and keep having faith that God can take care of things. All right, here we go, Carlene. Are you ready to sing with me now? All right. Oh, the mic. I have a mic. Here we go. Here, I'm getting out of that easy. Okay. You've heard this song a few times, but we're going to do it, and hopefully you'll enjoy it. Here we go. God held the light in the palm of his hand then he knelt on earth and he made the light a man and Jesus is that light shining all alone like a beacon in the distance showing the way Oh, care for the light, don't let it grieve away, for we have been entrusted with the coming light of day. Keep it burning, burning brighter, till Have you noticed in the light? 
we can see each other and now that we can see we can help one another keep it burning burning brighter till the darkness slowly fades away Jesus is that light Okay, back to chapter 43. A new thing in you. That's what God wants to do in you and me. He wants to do a new thing. And we're going to look at why. Finding a cold in a little bit. Of course, it might just be that I was out there cleaning off the van. That changing weather, getting out in it, you know. But anyway, you have, Carlene's been tested uh, for the COVID. She came out negative. So in our family, we don't have any occurrence of that. Uh, and so uh, we uh, do know, though, that the flu bug's going around. So be careful. Flu bug's going around. Um, colds are also going around. But let's look at the new thing in chapter 43, Isaiah chapter 43. But we're going to talk about some things first before we get completely into that. And let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you so much that you just don't get done with us when we belong to you, Father. You know, we know that we belong to you and you know that you love us. We know that you love us. And Father, even when we mess up, even when our past doesn't always bring the glory to you that it should, Father, we know that you want to cause things to work out for good as Romans chapter 8 says says uh, Romans 8 28 and that uh, you'll want to make all those things work out for good for them to love God and are called according to his purpose and you want to not only work everything out for good even our mistakes even our failures father you also want to cause things uh, in our lives to be of of a purpose of your purpose of your plan to know your plan we thank you for that Lord we thank you father that today you're going to show us more than ever your purpose, your plan, and your love for us through your word. Father, I thank you for your word. It's helped me so much in my present situation, in my past situations, and in the things to come. You're there for me. You've never failed me, though I've failed you a few times. But Father, we thank you for your forgiveness and your love, and for those that you bring around us to encourage us. We thank you, Father. We pray that you'd help everyone here to recognize that there's a new thing you want to do with each one of us that's here. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Mindy and Matt Hutchison with uh, Addie came all the way from Columbus area to be with us. Good to see you this morning. What a trip that was. Thank goodness the highways are in fairly good shape, but boy, when you get into some of the back roads and side roads in town and all, it's a little bit difficult, I know, especially our parking lot, but we will uh, do the best we can and be careful, right? Thanks for being here. Thank you for all of you with your dedication. Richard, so good to see you again. And wow, you know, it's good to know I've got help. And you know, in the things coming up, I mentioned, you know, get a few sermons together if you preach and God, and you know the Lord and you are, uh, and God has used you and, and you've mentioned to, to me before and I've probably mentioned it back to you, get ready. You know, we don't know what this avenue for Carlene and I is gonna hold. But there's a good chance we'll need some help here trying to get the pulpit filled and trying to make sure the word continues to go out. Okay? Now, Isaiah 43. 
As we look at this, I want you to know, I want to give you a little bit of background. The first 39 chapters of Isaiah talks about God warning Judah, which is, you remember that there was a split. The tribes of Judah, the tribe of Judah and the other tribes of Israel, they split. And Judah ended up having a lot of good kings, and Israel had a few good kings too when they, after they split. But it's just like life. Sometimes people make the right choices and the wrong choices. And sometimes Israel and Judah made wrong choices. Overall, God looks at them as his people. But uh, we know that uh, God here is warning Judah for the first 39 chapters in Isaiah. He's warning them that there's going to be a coming judgment because they haven't been complying completely with his word. In fact, they've been going their own way a lot of times and doing things that were not godly, things that were not bringing any glory to God, even though sometimes they would try to give the pretense it just isn't the same as, as serving God. And sometimes they were just blatantly out there doing their own thing. Wait a minute, doesn't that sound like us sometimes? Sometimes when we know we shouldn't be going against God's wishes and His will for our life, sometimes we made bad decisions. God was showing them in 39 chapters, warning them that there was coming a coming judgment. This coming judgment was going to happen. But the good news is in chapters 40 through 56, if you want to look at that, God is also giving them hope. Hope that God is going to continue to work with them. That he hasn't forgotten them. He will not forget them. And there's always a remnant of people that he knows are going to serve him. And he knows and he is going to be there for them. I mean, you know how it is. You remember back when you were a kid and, uh, and your mom and dad would spank you when you needed it, right? Yeah, some of you know that now. Well, if they didn't, somebody uh, let you get by with too much, right? But the fact is, if your, if your parents love you, they're going to spank you when you need it. But do you remember what would happen if somebody took it upon themselves sometimes without your parents' permission? That they maybe didn't know your parents very well or, or you as your, their children and wanted to try to take into their own hands their, their discipline upon you. Yes. That, that doesn't go over too well. I remember I had to tell somebody one time, I said, now look, you know, your children are your children. My children are my children. You won't take my child and throw my child around like a sack of potatoes. No, it ain't going to happen. Stop right there. That's it. And I, more times than not, I mean, several times I've had to come up to other people, sometimes family, sometimes others, and say, now, they are my responsibility. If you want to tell me what the problem is, I'll take care of it. And believe me, I would. But I was not going to have somebody else discipline my child because that is my responsibility. And you're not going to take my responsibility away from me. First of all, you don't love them enough to make sure it happens the right way. You might not know when to quit. Right? Now this is how God is with his people. It's his responsibility. He knows it to cause us to have chastisement when we walk out from underneath his loving hand. And he will whip us to get us back in, in his way, in his will. If we'll listen. If we don't listen, we'll, we'll cause ourselves to go through some consequences that might not be too good. And you know how your parents were. I'm only doing this because I love you. Remember that? Yeah. It, this hurts you more than it hurts me. Oh, yeah, I've heard those things. We grew up with that, too. And, and honestly, I, can have, I have to say... I really believe that my parents had my best interest in mind most of the time, if not all the time. I want you to know God knows what's happening. He knows our future. He knows what it takes to straighten us out. He knows when you and I are not following his plans for the best life that he wants us to live. And here's what's going on here. In those first 39 chapters, he's warning them through the prophet Isaiah that a judgment is coming. Because they have not been listening to God as his children. You know, they've not been listening. Ju and here's, the, the, the got in, they got to be in such bad shape that Judah, when things were looking bad, when, when the judgment looked like it was coming, and they could kind of see it now, as Isaiah had been warning them all along, they began to look to their enemy, Egypt, to try to get help. So, this is just a little lesson I want to help you with here. 
You and I need to make sure that when we begin to be chastised, we see judgment coming. And listen, all God does has to do is take his protection away from us. His, his loving hand, his protecting hand, Satan loves to get in there and destroy things. He'll get in there and he'll destroy your marriage. He'll destroy your work, your, your home life, your job, everything he can, he will get a hold of. And he will try to tear you down to try to make things miserable for you. And God will allow this to happen if you get out of his way and walk out from underneath his protection and his love. The fact is, God will allow judgment to come if that's what it takes to get you straightened out. Not a pretty picture either. But here they were, judgment was looming over the horizon here. The enemy was looking to come in upon them and they looked, began to look to Egypt when they saw the threat. Egypt having been an enemy also they began to look to their enemy for help. Not the enemy that was going to invade, but another enemy that did not have their best wishes and their best interest in mind. For help, you and I don't need to be turning to the enemy when we are in trouble. We need to remember this. We don't need to turn to the enemy when we are in trouble. Now, if we're not careful, we'll find ourselves turning to the wrong source of protection. We'll find ourselves putting ourselves in more jeopardy by causing a battle to be on more sides than just one. We've got to be careful. If the end, you know what? If a snake looks like a snake and if it hisses like a snake, it might be a snake. It probably didn't change its mind from being a snake from the last time it threatened you, right? If Egypt was the enemy and they had been the enemy and they continued to be through the years, but yet at the time, they, maybe they were being a little bit nicer to Judah. So this doesn't mean that you can trust Satan and his accomplices to be encouraging you and to be helping you in a time when they don't have your best interest in mind. God can take care of you. The best thing to do is stop running away from God, stop running away from facing the facts of whatever sin we might have in our lives, whatever disregard we may have had for God's plan, and get back in touch with God and let Him begin to forgive and help us to forget and help us to move forward, like I preached a couple Sundays ago. To move forward, we have to get to the place where we're willing to ask forgiveness, where we're willing to get to the place where we can see that God's plan is the best plan and we need to be willing to put our lives back in God's hand so that we can see that God has our best interest in mind. Now, I want you to know this. The coming judgment, it will come and it won't be because God wants to do it. It'll be because the chastisement will come our way because he loves us so much and his protection may not be there and if we are turning away from God, he may let us go through some things that may not be so pretty. So one, one thing we need to remember, don't turn to the enemy. They may look like they might want to help you. People may look like they've got the right solutions. But listen, if, if they're not in God's plan, stay away from it. If God hasn't shown you that they are of God, don't fall into that trap. You make sure that the people around you that say they love you, that's, that say that they're on your side and God's side, you make sure they are because your life is in jeopardy if they are not. I'm talking about your life. I'm talking about God's will for your life and his plan for you. They can mess things up. I mean, you may think you've messed things up sometimes, but when we put our lives into somebody else's hands and we put our direction into somebody else's choices, we can make things a whole lot worse than what they are. For help, don't turn toward the enemy when trouble comes. God's word says in Isaiah chapter 43, verse 1, I created you, I formed you. You can read that if you want to. I'm not going to take the time to do that right now, but God is talking about having created us, how he's formed us. If our creator formed us, he knows what our mind works like. He knows what we, our talents are and our skills are, and he knows what we should be doing because he formed us. Like it says about Jeremiah, when Jeremiah when speaks about that, that he was formed, God molded him in his mother's womb. He formed, he knew him. He knew him when he was in his mother's womb. 
pro-life, I want you to know. There you go. There's some proof. He knows us even when we're growing inside our mother's womb. He has a plan. He knows us when we're born and isn't by accident. It's like Carlene when, when, when we couldn't, she couldn't have a child and, and uh, it was four years. We were wanting to know, wait a minute, four years now. It's not like, you know, that, that's kind of not normal. So she went to the doctor. She had a tumor. Uh, it was not cancerous, but it was a tumor in her ovary and in a fallopian tube and, and so on. It was, it was all messed up. And the other one was messed up with scar tissue. Doctor said 99% chance you won't have children. She had a child over a year later or so, I'm not sure how many, how, well, a year and a half or something like that. But uh, she got, she conceived and several times had miscarriages. And I said, hey, let's look at it this way. At least you can do that. But I just say that to say this. We, when we want to name that child, it was Tiffany, our first child. We were thinking of a name and we didn't really know the meaning of the name yet. But boy, Tiffany sounded awfully good. You know, we named her Tiffany. And then we realized and found out later, you know what Tiffany means? The appearance of God reborn. That's what God had done in our lives. He does use names, by the way. He can be in the name when you name a child. Just like Rachel, a little lamb full of trust. If you know Rachel, you know she's like, she's got that nature, that loving nature. She's just a trusting individual. But that appearance of God reborn. That means God was, had appeared in our life and he had done something that needed to be done because he loved us that much. The appearance of God. He appeared and his life in us again was reborn. But through Tiffany, he showed life. He showed that his, his plan was still in effect, that he hadn't forgotten about us. He wants to do that for you. He wants to give you new life. He wants to be you to be reborn. If you don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior, you need to be born again, by the way. God's Word says, ask forgiveness for your sin. Ask Him to come into your heart. Jesus Christ, come into your heart and be your Savior. And then profess Him, Lord, I believe you're my Savior. I'm trusting you. I know I have eternal life. That's what God wants us to do. It's so simple that people overlook it. But the day I got up from the pew and came up to the altar and did that, let me tell you, my life was changed forever. Not only did my life get changed, and God began to do special things in my life, just like he did in Judah when they were listening and when they were following his plan, and just like he did with Judah even when they had messed up and he protected as many of them as, he, as would let him protect. He, uh, let, him, let him protect. Uh, they, he went ahead and took care of them and so on. He left a remnant and he continued to have a people. He wants you to be part of the solution that he has for this world. That he wants you to be a part of the solution he has for your family. Somebody's got to tell them about Jesus. You can't count on the school system to tell them because it's, now they don't want anybody to say anything about Jesus in the school system, by the way. You can't depend on politics to help people to know the right way to go because it don't always go like God would have it go. How do I know that? Because I've watched over the years. Listen, we need God's plan. We need God's help. He, we need you and me to listen to God and to tell our grandchildren, to tell our children about Jesus Christ and about the need to be saved. So here was was Isaiah telling Judah, yes, you need to trust the Lord. You need him. And don't be turning to the enemy in times of trouble. And notice what else he said. I formed you, 43 verse 1, and also fear not. He don't want you to fear. He wants you to find a solution in your trouble, which is him. Don't fear. Fear not. I redeemed you. Don't you fear you may have found reason to fear because you may have messed things up that badly. You may have made some wrong decisions. Your job may not look as secure as it used to be. It might be that your finances seem to be in trouble. Maybe we bought too much food. Maybe we bought too much luxury. Maybe we couldn't afford some things that we ended up using our money for and we didn't know the signs of the time were looking as bad as they were. And before you know it, man, things went south in a hurry, didn't they? Maybe you're in financial problems right now, but here's the thing. He not only formed us, he said, don't you fear. 
I redeemed you. He didn't redeem us or save us, even though we weren't. I mean, necessarily, we didn't think that we were anything special. We may, and while we were yet in sin, we were saved. You and I accepted Jesus as our Savior. He loved us while we were yet in sin and found that we wanted to found us in our sin and saved us. And that's what he wants to do for you that are lost too. By the way, you may think you're beyond help. You may think that there's no hope uh, for you and no help at all, but he wants to redeem you. And those of us that have been redeemed, he wants us to remember that we don't need to fear because we, he's redeemed us. And not only that, listen to this. I called you by name. There's something special in these names I want you to know. Especially when you're dealing with God in your life and in your children and in your family. There's something special. Check it out sometime and see what, what is in a name. <clears throat> I called you by name. Now here's what God's word is saying right here. He knows your name. Whatever they called you, he knows who you are is what he's saying. I know you. Not only do I know you, I know you by name. I mean, I know you well enough, I can reach out to you. Just like your mom or dad would reach out to you and say, Hey, get over here. Stay out of that trouble. Get over, you know who you are. My dad used to give us that right, read the right act. Now look, you remember who you belong to now. Don't act out while we're over there at the, that house where those kids are. Don't, don't think you can do everything they do just because you're with them. You remember who you belong to and you act like it. Oh yeah, we had the riot act. How many of you had the riot act read to you when you were going to visit someplace? Oh yeah. <clears throat> Why did they do it? Because they loved you and because they cared. And they didn't want you to pick up some bad habits and bad direction just because other people around you might be doing it. So when God's word says he called us by name, that's what he means. That he knows who you are. He knows how to reach you. He is in touch with you. Even if you're lost, he's in touch with you because he knows what you've been through. He knows what you're going through. He knows how terrible things can be for you sometimes. He knows that you may have lost hope in everything in life. That you found that you can't trust finances or, or a good job or, or you can't trust somebody else and you can't ride into heaven on somebody else's coattails. He may know, well, he, he knows all these things and he knows that you're going through things. Maybe things in marriage aren't so good and you're looking up and down and bad and, and different things and, and you know now that, boy, it takes more than just good relationships to make you happy in life. It takes the Lord. God knows that. He, listen, you heard that old thing about a phone call from God. You ever hear that? You ought to, you ought to listen to that skit sometime or that, that record or whatever. We had it on a record or something. A phone call from God and the guy picks it up and it's God on the phone talking to this man. What do you mean I might need that, not need that boat if I don't get things straightened out, if I don't start going to church and all that? And I, that's why I was out of church because I was boating and I was doing this and that and, and you know, I didn't have time. What do you mean I might need, not need that boat? What? And he hangs up after a little while. He had found everything to do and all the excuses he wanted to give to God and God would just tell him, hey, you might not have those things if you don't listen up here. So he hangs up the phone and his wife says, what was that, a wrong number? And the man says to his wife, no, believe me, he had my number. God has your number. He has my number. He knows your name. He formed you. Of course he knows your life. He knows what you're going through. He knows what you've been through. Listen, you can use every excuse in the world to live like the devil because somebody treated you bad. And that you can have pity on yourself and just say, well, you know, if those things had to happen to me, I wouldn't have to steal or I wouldn't have to be mean to other people. I wouldn't have to lie and cheat and connive. I wouldn't have been mean or bad or I wouldn't have done some wrong things and made bad choices if people hadn't been so mean to me when I was growing up. I don't know about you, but those, those big excuses didn't seem to work too well in my family. You know, they didn't seem to work too well. Because I got that riot act pretty often. You know, you know who you belong to. 
You know how you need to act. I didn't teach you to do this or that. Now you straighten up. Now you heard those talks. You've had a few yourself. And God is telling you and I, he knows our name, he formed us, he knows all about us. Those excuses won't work when it comes to doing your own thing. That's not a good enough excuse to live life the way that you shouldn't live it. But you'll stand in front of God. God has a record, God's word is, he's keeping a record of the moment you're living down here. He knows all about us, all of our sorrows and fears. And so he knows all that we're going through. He knows the good things and the bad things we've been through. He keeps a record. Yes, he knows. He has mercy. He has care. But we've got to recognize he has mercy. He does care. He wants to redeem us. And if he has redeemed us, he wants us to come to him and not turn to the wrong sources for help. Pray about it. Pray about what you need to do. Let God begin to show you and read his word. Get the instruction manual for life out and begin to look through it. Psalms tells us how we can calm down, how we can look to God for worship and how we can smooth, let God smooth things out in our hearts and settle our hearts and our fears in the midst of trouble. Proverbs, wisdom, look through there and find some wisdom so we know how to act. So we know what God wants us to do. There's things that we know in God's word that he says to avoid, that he says we shouldn't do, and that he says we should do. Proverbs is full of those things, not to mention the gospel, the teachings of Jesus. And God's word tells us something that I think we should always remember. We should love our neighbor as ourselves. A man came to Jesus and said, what is the greatest commandment? And if he had said the wrong one, then he had probably argued with Jesus, you know. If he said one that he thought to, to, to Jesus was more important. But Jesus said, what well, does the word say? He said, well, the Lord thy God, love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, mind, strength, and soul. And thy neighbor as thyself. But he said, well, you know, that's, you know this, so go and do those things. And so this is very important that we recognize that. Now, one of the, the principles there that we don't want to overlook is that we need to love our neighbor as ourselves. Now, if we're not loving ourselves because we're not, we're not being honest with God and we're not in the right relationship with God, then we, there is no way we can be loving ourselves the right way if our relationship with God is not what it should be. We need to be honest with God. We need to let Him straighten us out. We need to let Him show us what needs to be corrected so we can find God's love the way we should be living and doing the things He wants us to do so the real love in our heart is what it needs to be. And then we can treat our neighbors better. Then we can uh, treat our brothers around us, those people around us, the way we should. Love thy neighbor as thyself. Now, I don't know about you, but I've had some neighbors that were pretty good. Let me tell you, I have. Then I've had a few stinkers, too. And I had to pray and ask God, God, what do I need to do? And he had to show me some good things to do to, to, to react to some of those neighbors. And you know what? And by the way, your neighbor doesn't necessarily mean the person that lives next to you. Who is your neighbor? Remember the Good Samaritan story? Your neighbor is the one that you can help, the one that it might be laying on the side of the road that you can reach out to. Who was the neighbor of this man? The Good Samaritan was. The priest walked by. So did the Levite that worked in the temple. He walked by too and didn't even help. They walked on the other side so they wouldn't have to acknowledge there was somebody that needed help and care. But the Good Samaritan, the half-breed, the people that Jews looked down upon because they weren't full Jews, he stopped by, helped that man took him, got him a room at an inn, and gave money to the innkeeper, said, look, by the time I come back here, if you've spent more money, if it takes more money, you tell me, and I will repay you for what you've spent. That is a good neighbor right there. Are you a good neighbor? Are you looking around to see what God says you should be like? Or is your relationship so poor with God that you don't know what it means to live for the Lord like you should right now? Are you a good neighbor? And I'm not talking about State Farm. Is that the one like a good neighbor? State Farm is there. I'm not talking about State Farm mentality here. 
I'm talking about God mentality. I mean, State Farm might be good and everything. I like it. Sure. But still, I'm talking about what does God say? That's a pretty good phrase too, by the way. But they didn't get it on their own. See? It's in God's Word first. Like a good neighbor, God is there if we will let Him have a relationship with us and show us how to be that good neighbor. Love our neighbor as ourselves. We need to love ourselves. And if you love yourself, you're going to get back in a relationship with God where you can hear His voice. He wants to call your name. He may be calling your name to try to get your attention. He may be wanting you to remember that He's redeemed you. He's formed you. He created you. He knows how to use you and direct your path. Don't leave it to somebody else that doesn't necessarily have your best interest in mind. If I can get this through today, I've really done something. If I can just get this point through. Don't leave your direction in life and your responsibilities in life and your, your purpose in life to somebody else calling the shots that say they've got your best interest in mind. You put your best interest in God's hands and you ask Him and you seek His love and His direction through prayer and reading God's Word and find out what God's best interest and best plan for you is. Please, don't forsake doing that Look to God and let Him be the parent to you that He wants to be. And if you don't know the Lord, you're really missing out. You're really missing out on direction in life that God can help you with. Now, He called you by name. He redeemed you. He formed you in the mother's womb. So, first of all, He talks to us about judgment coming. We can look at Judah and we can see that judgment was coming for them. But listen... If you think you can live any way you want to and just do your own thing, I want you to know there are consequences. God loves you so much, though. He's probably reading you the riot act, if that's what you're doing right now, like your parents used to do. You know, remember who you belong to. Remember what you should be doing. Remember you can't act like everybody else. You belong to me, he's saying. I called you by name. I formed you. I know you. Why are you trusting other people and believing what they say about your life? So we need to remember that something might be coming that we've caused. Remember David when he counted his army and he, he was looking at the number of his army and he thought, boy, I just want to know my strength. I feel pretty good about being king here. Got one of the greatest armies, if not the greatest one in the world right now. I want to see what my strength's like. And he, and he sent Joab out to number number the army and it was a it was a selfish it was a thing to do that was his own plan it wasn't in god's plan god judged him for that too he let his consequences come upon him for that what happened well he said well you can have i, I can let a pestilence come in or, or you know or i or i can let the enemy come in what would you what would you have me do so the, the prophet's talking to him about it. And David said, I don't want to fall into the hands of men. I would rather fall into the hands of the living God. How about you? Why? Because God has mercy. He loves us. I don't want some other parent to whip me, do you? I don't want to be whipped by somebody that don't have my best interest in mind. I want my loving God that saved me, that formed me, that redeemed me. I want Him to correct me if I'm going to be corrected. I want Him to do what's best and necessary for me because He does have your best interest and my best interest in mind. So when you pass through, second point I want to make here, so when the coming judgment's coming, you remember He is your Heavenly Father. He formed you. He knows you. He redeemed you. He called you by name. Why trust anyone else? Why trust any other solution other than God? Fall into the hand of the living God. Ask Him for forgiveness, for mercy. And God is there. His mercies are new every morning, aren't they? <laughs> Isn't that wonderful to think about? His mercies are new every morning. Oh my goodness, thank God he, He's there for me. Even in, when I mess up, He's there. They're new every morning. He wants to do a new thing. And He can do a new thing if we're not holding on to old ways. Don't hold on to the old ways. 
Don't be stuck in a rut by things that you've been doing just because other people are doing them or things that you thought were the best thing to do that you might not have checked out with God. Let's begin to ask God and read through his word and have a real relationship with him and let him show us. Now listen, let's be careful what we do. Let's just not make a spur of the moment decision. Let's seek wise counsel. Proverbs says that. So if we want to be consoled, we want to see how to worship God, we want to have fellowship with God, Psalm is wonderful. We want some real truth uh, also that will show us how to make decisions and, and how, to, who to, how we know who to trust and, and what to do about life situations. Proverbs is wonderful. The Gospels are wonderful if we want to know how to deal with our fellow person around us and how People can make bad decisions that say they are Christians like the disciples made bad decisions many times. I'm going fishing. Who's going with me? Well, you know, all of them are going fishing. You know what? We can cause people to go the wrong way, can't we? But here, the second thing we need to remember is when you pass through the waters, God will be with you. If you look at uh, verse 2, look at verse 2 with me, if you will. Chapter 43. Isaiah chapter 43. When thou passest through the waters, I will be with thee, and through the rivers they shall not overflow thee. When thou walkest through the fire, thou shalt not be burned, neither shall the flame kindle upon thee. And then he gives us the reason why we can do that. When you're passing through the water, that's talking about passing through trouble. He's talking to Judah, but his, his character is the same whether he's talking to Judah as a nation or as a split nation with Isaac of Israel, or if he's talking to you and I as individuals, his nature is the same. His character never changes. He's the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. What is he, what is he saying here? When you're passing through the water of troubles in life, I will be with you. And through the rivers, it may look rocky, it may look bad, they shall not overflow thee. It may look pretty threatening, but God can handle it. He can take care of us. When thou walkest through the fire, I mean, when it seems like things are burning us alive sometimes, when it seems like they can just overtake us, listen, God is with us, he can take care of us. Thou shalt not be burned. He can keep us from being damaged. Other people may have wanted to damage your life. How many people would raise your hand and say, you know, there have been people in life that wanted to damage me sometimes. Raise your hand. I want to see. Okay. Yeah, there you go. Everybody. Everybody today, there's people out there and even on the internet that want to bully you, want to make you feel bad, want to feel, make you feel like less of a person. Let me tell you, let God help you with that relationship. Let him help you to know how he can take care of you. When you're passing through the trouble, when you are seeing the threat of what looks like the rivers overtaking you in life, and they won't overflow you, and you will, your troubles, he'll help you to pass through those troubles. When thou walkest through the fire, when it looks like you're going to get burned by somebody or something or a situation, let me tell you what, God knows what's best. I've had people come up to me and say, man, I can't believe you came through this like you did. Well, it wasn't me. One person said to me one time, I said, what do you think about this job I just, I got? He said, I don't know. I just never had a job fall right into my lap before. I said, well, no, it wasn't God. It wasn't me. It was God. God had a plan. Of course, I had to take a course here and a course there, and, and I had to be ready, you know, and I had to make sure that, you know, I, I, if you get a job comes open, remember me in this. And you know what? God works. God can show us what to say, what to do, how to prepare for what he wants us to go through, through the fire and in the troubles of life as we're going through the waters of life. The rivers that might be threatening. He can take care of us. Neither shall the flame kindle upon thee. It might look like everybody's getting consumed by what's going on. But if you belong to the Lord, he can keep you from catching fire with the rest of those people. Oh, yeah. yeah. He can help you make wise decisions. He can have no, help you know when to not get involved in that fire that's going around in the shop. The rumor mill. The character assaults that happen. Don't get involved. 
Don't get involved. Just remember that God loves you. And note, notice why he says you can do that. Look at the verb, next verse, verse 3. For I am the Lord thy God, the Holy One of Israel, thy Savior. I gave Egypt for thy ransom, Ethiopia and Seba for thee. Since thou wast precious in my sight, thou hast been honorable, and I have loved thee. Therefore, I will give men for thee and people for thy life. Fear not, for I am with thee. I will bring thy seed from the east and gather thee from the west. I will say to the north, give up, and to the south, keep not back. Bring my sons from far and my daughters from the ends of the earth. Everyone that is called by my name, for I have created him for my glory. I have formed him, yea, I have made him. How about that? I think God has it handled, don't you? I think God can take care of us. So as we look at this, if you want to let God do that new thing, that God wants to do in your life. We need to remember that in the coming judgment that we may have caused consequences to come upon us. God has solutions for us. He knows who we are. He formed us. He redeemed us. He called us by name. He can take us through the waters of life. He can take us through those times that might be fearful. He can help us. He can take us through the flames so that we're not burned by others and those that would want to do that. And notice the third thing. Do not remember the former things and events that have occurred. Look at verse 18. Look at verse 18 now. Remember ye not the former things, neither consider the things of old. Wow, that is necessary. We need to look at verse 18 in chapter 43, and we need to see that verse. We need to mark that verse because this is key. It's a key verse to being able to let God do something new in our lives. He's saying, look, you remember, don't remember. He said, remember ye not the former things, neither consider the things of old. Listen, you need to remember to not remember those things that were before, the former things, the things that were failures in your life, the things that were mistakes, the, the problems and, and all that. Remember, don't you remember those things? Don't consider the things of old. Don't you think that just because things were that way and remained that way, they don't have to remain that way. Sometimes we're defeated by our own selves by thinking that things have to stay the way they are. That we'll never get any better than what we are right now. That we'll never be able to do anything differently because you know what? We failed in the past. We've tried before. We've attempted and it didn't happen. We didn't achieve Whose plan were we really following? Were we following our own plan? Were we following some person that we thought were, was somebody that was really on our side when they weren't? Was it some enemy that Satan had planted that caused us to follow the wrong advice? And we were following God and trusting in his will and having faith to know that, you know, God's going to take care of me. I'm just going to do things God's way. And you know, what do you do when you don't know what to do? I've got a message on that on each one of these days. What do you do when you don't know what to do? Now, there's some time when we think, you know, I, I know I should be doing some things. I, I know that there's some decisions I need to make. What do I do when I don't know what to do? You do the things that you know you should do. There's plenty of things in God's word that he tells us to do. What are some of those things? Go to church. Read the word. Be in prayer. Have fellowship with God's people. Don't forsake that. It's getting awfully easy for people to stay home with, with their cup of coffee and in their house coat and with their slippers on, sliding to the kitchen, getting a refill, and sometimes forgetting to come back to the message. That's how easy it is to get out of God's word. And goodness knows we need encouragement to stay in his word. And then they forget, oh, when church is open, they forget to come back. Let me tell you, it is your responsibility as God's people to get back, to get in touch with God, to stay in his word. You and I, it's our responsibility to remember that he has a plan and it's a new thing he wants to do in you and I. And in order to get that plan going that he wants us to be a part of, that new thing he wants to do. 
we have to remember that things don't have to stay the way they've always been or have been lately. And thank God 2020 is over. Thank God that don't have to stay that way and that we can get back to some things that we know are true and right that we should be doing. And yes, it may not be as convenient and as, as easy as it was, but believe me, if we ever needed to get close to Jesus, it's now. We don't know what's on the future horizon. We know that we need to trust the Lord like never before. <laughs> So, so we, know, we know then that when we pass through these waters and, and uh, these rivers of life, through these fires of life that seem to be coming our way, we can trust the Lord. Why? Because He is our Redeemer. He is our God. He is the Lord. He loves us. And listen, He's saying, don't you trust those enemies that you've tried before? Look, don't you remember? I ransomed you away from those people. I already took you out of their hands. And now you're going to trust them again? Come on. You've tried some of those things out before. They didn't work before. Why should they work again? That's what he's telling them. And that's what he wants us to realize. Don't follow those stupid plans you followed before. Because guess what? He wasn't in them. You were going the wrong way. Doing your own thing. We get ourselves in trouble. And before we know it, we're hurting. Yes. And we will get burned that way. But let's put our, ourselves in God's hand like David said. I want to follow in the hands of the living God rather than the hands of man. I want to follow his leadership, don't you? We, we've got to remember not the former things. That means those things that were before, those ruts, those stuck in a rut things we've been doing. Those things that we got used to in 2020 that, that kept us away from God, that caused us not to be serving God the way we should. I heard, I talked to a friend of mine that accepted the Lord over at uh, Vision Mart when I worked there as a graphic designer. And uh, I left and uh, went to seminary, then went to the military to pay for seminary. And he called me when I was in the military. He said, Tony, I accept the Lord as my Savior. Who is this? He said, this is John. John who? It's John Morrison. John, you mean you accept the Lord? He said, yes, I was listening to you. I listened. And I don't know if I said it or not, but I thought of all the people I least expected to accept the Lord, it was John. I had no idea he was listening. I thought other people were, but he was listening. And he said, now I keep a pack of cookies on my desk. And I ask if they want one, they can have one. And I talk to them a little bit about the Lord when they come over and get one. He was listening. He was watching. Now he goes to the hospitals and visits people when they can. You know, this has been a difficult year. And then he said, Tony, guess what? He, I talked to him yesterday. He said, praying for your wife, by the way, he told me. Now I've got my church praying. I've got other people praying to tell everybody you want to. At that right, Carlene's smiling and laughing. She knows, John. Listen, though. And he said, you know what else I'm doing? I'm giving potato chips, Pringles, and pop to my neighbors around me in the name of the Lord for the Super Bowl. I'm doing that. He said, I'll be out this afternoon doing that after church and making sure that they recognize that even though this is a wonderful day when for ball and sports, and he loves sports, so do I, but you know, the fact is God comes first. And he's going to put God for it and go out there and distribute food and soda pop to let people know God's first in his life. And he just wants to show God's love. Isn't that wonderful? Wonderful. That's a great thing we can do too, right? So anyway, I just want to say that we, he, I, he wasn't remembering them. I know how he was. I heard the stories. But listen, God got a hold of him and redeemed him. And he had to let God show him. And, and life wasn't perfect for him. There were things that he wasn't happy about that worked out in his life and didn't work out like he thought. But he's still serving God. You and I, we can still be serving God. Minion matter here. They're still serving God. They got Addie the right of the right way. Andrew, her son, married Sammy that God gave him in spite of Andrew. No, I'm just teasing. Andrew and Sammy are great kids. And you know, they got that little little Winry now. God is bringing up another family in his hands because of you. Because of Grandma Storm and Dean. 
Matt, you've been doing what I just want to say, listen, God knows your situations. And these kids don't just happen to come to know Jesus. They need a witness. They need grandparents that can tell. They need parents that are willing to tell them about Jesus. And so I'm just saying this and look at Maria here with all these grandkids here. Aren't they something? And Todd, I bet you feel pretty special sitting on that pew there, don't you? Huh? Huh? Aren't they? Aren't you all something? So I just want to say, listen, we've got to remember to forget those former things, the stuck in the rut things, and remember what God can do like he's doing with you. What God wants to do like he's done with you. Like the things he's done for you in the past. Like he's helped a few people in some terrible scrapes they've been in. And physically, I didn't know if they'd be here walking around and being able to see, but they're here today. I'm serious. Don't you think God's hands have been on a few people? Absolutely. God's word says in James chapter 1, verse 17, all good and perfect gifts come from God, from the Father of lights, in whom is no variableness nor shadow of turning. So if it's been good and it's been perfect that's happening, it's because you reached out the right direction to let God help you with something, and God blessed it. Let's not forget that. Those former things that were terrible, that didn't work out so well, were the things that you took into your own hands and you made a mess of. Let's just put it right where it is. And you made wrong choices. Now, now we need to let God help us to not remember those former things, to not remember how we were stuck in a rut and that we and, and be that way still. We, we've got to remember that these things don't need to be remembered when it comes to what God wants to do in our lives right now. He wants us to forget our past failures. He wants us to forget that things were not so great in 2020. He wants us to remember now it's time to consider that these things of old don't have to be remembered and believed to be necessary in our lives again. Now, you know, wear your mask, keep the safe distancing and all that stuff, but remember to go to church. Remember to come and worship God. Remember to be around God's people. Remember to have, remember to have fellowship. Remember to do the right things. Remember what God says to do. Remember to read God's word. Remember to seek his will and his talents and skills in your life. Some of you have skills and talents you haven't even tapped yet. Listen, some of you don't think that you're worth much. You're so valuable you don't even remember. You're, you, don't, you don't even know how valuable you are. So let's look at this now. Third point. Do not remember the former things, events. We're talking about events and occurrences in your life. Whether you made them happen or somebody else made them happen. Whether they influenced you or you influenced yourself. It don't matter. If they were negative things and they were not positive things and they were not godly things. It's time you move beyond it. Move forward to what God wants to do. New. The new things. In your life. He wants to do a new thing. Verse 19. Behold I will do a new thing. He will. Not only for the nation of Judah. Did he do a new thing. He wants to do a new thing in your life. If we'll listen to him. And let him move us out of our stuck in a rut. Life. If, if we'll let him move us away from the failures. In the past that wasn't necessarily. A wonderful thing to think about it anyway. We've got to remember we belong to him. Remember who you belong to. Remember, he created you. He formed you. He knows your inner being. He knows your capabilities. He's got you on his mind when he was forming you. When he was creating you. And he knew what you could be capable of. And he has a plan for you. If you'll seek his plan and read his word. Remember not former things. Nor, neither consider the things of old. Behold I will do a new thing. Now it shall spring forth. Shall you not know it? I will even make a new way. Or make a way in the wilderness. And rivers in the desert. I want to help you with that now. Now. Next thing. Point four is. God will do a new thing. These are the things, four things we need to remember if we're going to let God do a new thing in our life. He wants to. 
God, we've got to remember that He wants to do a new thing. And listen, you're going to know it. You're going to know that God's at work. Don't mess it up. Don't miss the opportunities. Don't miss it. You will know it. Then He'll make a road in the wilderness. Now, what does that mean, a road in the wilderness? A road in, what is a wilderness like? You know wilderness. I don't know. I don't want to be stuck in the wilderness, do you? Wilderness implies several things. Real, wilderness implies lack of connection. Lack of connection with others. Lack of connection maybe with fellowship. Lack of being connected in your life to things that would be fulfilling or useful. Or lack of being finding purpose. He says, now you may be there right now. And, and wilderness also implies loneliness. Have, how many of you have been lonely before? Raise your hands. Wow. Every one of us have been lonely, haven't we? We've all been lonely. Listen, God says he can do something with us when we're in that wilderness of loneliness and wilderness of things not going the way they should in our life. Lack of connections, lack of connection where it feels like we got purpose. And it feels like things can't go the way that they would be fulfilling in our lives. Listen. He said he'll make rivers in the desert. He will find you. He knows where you are anyway. He can find you. He can make the connection to get you back. Get you back to where you need to be. Bring you out of that loneliness. Give you the purpose you need to have. He can do it. New life. He wants to do a new thing. Notice what it says here. Let's read that again. Behold, I will do a new thing. Now it shall spring forth. It's new life. It's new purpose. It's new excitement. It's new things that we can do that causes us to love life. Wonderful. He wants to do it. Now it shall spring forth. Shall you not know it? And you're going to know it that he's at work. Look at you. You know that God is with you. You know that God is the one that's been watching over you. Those good and perfect things have been happening. You know God's been involved. And he, you know what the things he wants to do now. Listen to him. He says, I will even make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. He's going to make a way. He'll make a way. And he'll make rivers in the desert to get you connected. Rivers of refreshment. Rivers of, of encouragement. Rivers of life-giving sources that will cause you to be able to have what you need to follow his purpose. That's how simple it is. I remember jumping when I was at Fort Bragg, North Carolina. Sometimes we'd jump, a lot of were night jumps. Night jumps and we'd be uh, jumping in the, the sandy drop zones. They were all sandy, thank goodness. And then we'd do the PLS land, you know, and we'd land and we'd take our chutes off and, and uh, we'd fold them up and put them on, in our deployment bag and we'd carry our deployment bag with us. We'd be looking around, where is, and in, in the pitch dark now, let me tell you, you had to have an idea of what was around you. Stars, moon, direction. You know, you had to kind of look around and say, okay, now, I landed here, but I'm here. The, the moon is over there. Big Dipper is over there, whatever. And you had to use whatever sources. And I see, and by the way, I think I see somebody walking that direction. It's pitch black, but I can see some shadows. And you start walking. You're walking. And you're walking through that perimeter that has been made by the other jumpers and by the people that are collecting you to take you back to the post. You know, in the pitch black, in the darkness, sometimes it seems like it's hard to find your way around. But did you know God has a way of making some things obvious, even though it may look pretty slim sometimes to see your way clear? God, can, you, you're going to know it. When God's at work, ask him. If you don't know it, you know it, ask him, God, is this you? Is this really what you want me to do? And he might say something like this sometimes. Are you foolish or something? Do you think God wants you to do something like you're thinking about doing? Now, come on. I've taught you better than that. I've raised you better than that. I've shown you better. Why are you believing these lies? You see what I'm saying? He, if anybody's going to be truthful with me, I know it'll be God. He'll be truthful with you. Just ask him. It's the, those, the times that we don't ask, we get in big trouble. I like my wife when she says, I'll ask her how things are, you know, how things went. She'll be truthful. I'll ask her, but she'll tell me the truth, even if it hurts. But I need to hear the truth. I need to hear it, and you do too. 
Why ask somebody that's going to lie to you? There's always somebody out there who'll try to paint a pretty picture when the picture isn't as pretty as what you think it needs to be or should be. <clears throat> Remember now, we need to do that new thing. You're going to know it when he's doing it. He'll make a road. He'll make provisions. He will cause you to not to be lonely as he brings you out of that desert place. As he brings in rivers of resources and he brings that new life. To give you that new thing that he wants to be a part of your life. That new purpose that he's bringing to your life. Here's something I want us to know. 2020 had some good purposes. It's kind of hard to see them right now. Some of us had to let go of a few things that we had been a part of. Right? That we were used to doing. Some things that consumed some time that we shouldn't have given it to. Some things that were distractions, maybe. Uh, some things that we wasted time and effort and usefulness on, our own usefulness. And it might, we, might have had, we might have had to let go of some things that, that drained some finances. We may have let go of some roads, or we may have seen the need in our lives, not just in 2020, but in our lives. We, he, God has shown us before. That we've had to let go of selfishness and, and unconcern for things that we should have been concerned about. He's shown us how we really need to be concerned about our families. Because it could be one of that number. Many people didn't make it through 2020. And many people are not making it now. Listen, he's shown us how fragile life could be. Even with God's protection, God takes people home, you know. But he also shows us, if we'll listen, that we need to be concerned. We need not to have a lack of care and a lack of love. We need to make sure we love people now. We need to show our concern and care now. We don't know the future. God knows it. He knows all about it. Listen, don't we need God's help? Don't we need his direction, the new thing, the new purpose that God wants to show us? He wants our life to be a new thing, a new purpose, full of new life, full of the resources he wants to provide. Don't get all drowned in that idea that, well, it hasn't worked out before. You know what? Forget those former things, those old things. Listen to what God wants to do for you and for us. It's exciting to know that God has done what he has done and that he's able to do the things he wants to do. Now we're coming to a close, James. If you'll uh, go ahead and, and go ahead and, and film this, and view this will uh, in, in the camera, the, in, the invitation. I'm going to give an invitation. Let's everybody stand. Some of us are going to Sea Town Wings to have some fellowship that we haven't been able to have for quite a while. And in honor of Mindy and Matt and Abby and Andrew and Sammy and Winry, we're going with them to celebrate with them how God is at work in their family. And we're going to have fellowship with them at Sea Towns. I want to invite you to come. But this is a little bit about what God's talking about. We appreciate people now while we can. Show our love. Show our care. Fellowship with God's people. Know God's plan. Now, uh, let's bow our heads and close our eyes for just a moment. Has God talked to you? Has he been speaking to you today? Have you found yourself kind of stuck in a rut with the things of the past? Thinking that as a devil fed this line to you, look, you've never amounted to much. Why should you amount to much now? Oh, he's used that on me quite a few times. And I've missed opportunities because of that. I want you to know. Now, it's time that we begin to listen to what God's word says to do. We need to look for the new thing that God is wanting to do for us right now and get beyond that former self. The old things. Don't remember the former things, those occurrences and events that were detrimental to us as God's people. It's time that we let God part the waters for us. It's time that we 
look to him for the right kind of help instead of other people that don't have our interest in mind. And it's time when we realize that there are coming consequences if we continue to follow the wrong sources and the wrong ways in life. There is a coming consequence. And there is a coming judgment. But guess what? We bring it upon ourselves. We do it. God don't want to have to do anything to you like that. You're his children. Remember, like your mom and dad used to say, I love you. That's why I'm doing I'm letting you go through these things right now. I would chastise you because I would whip you because I want you to know how much I love you. God loves us that much. He loves you that much. Now, with their heads bowed and eyes closed, I wonder, has he said to you today, yes, some things can afford to be changed in your life right now. Would you raise your hands? He's shown you that. There's some things that might need to be changed. Can, would you raise your hands real big, real big? Push that hand up there. There it is, yes. Let's raise our hands. I'm raising both hands. He showed me, yes. We need to realize he wants to change some things. Thank you so much. Thank you for being honest with God. Not just me, but God. Thank you so much. Now, if you know that God has called you to see the new things that he wants you to be aware of, listen to those things. Listen to what he's showing you. Don't find yourself believing the old lies that Satan has. Remember now, you read God's word, go to prayer, pray about decisions, do the things God wants you to do, and let him begin to give you the resources and the help that you need to make the good decisions that you should and follow his plan and his purpose. And listen, what do you do if you're not sure? Do the things that are right to do, the things that God's word, word has told you to do. In his word. Go to church. Read the word. Pray. Be around God's people. Love your brother like you love, like you love yourself. And if you don't love yourself, love yourself the way God wants you to. If you don't know Jesus Christ, your Savior, it's time you stop waiting. Turn to the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior. Accept him. Ask forgiveness for your sin. Ask him to come into your heart and profess him as your Savior. And then say, thank you, Lord. I believe. I know where I'm going when I die. Thank you, Father, for your love and your purpose and your Savior that you've given me. There you go. See, it can be that easy. But it means denying yourself and doing what God wants you to do. Now, heads are bowed, eyes are closed. How many of you are going through financial problems right now? You need a little bit of help. You need a little bit of prayer about things. Don't be ashamed to raise your hand. Listen, it's been tough on a lot of people right now. Can you raise your hand? Do you need help? Financially, things might be better for you. Okay. And it could be that physically, medically, you're going through some things. Raise your hand. I want to pray for you. There's a hand. Somebody else. Emotionally, there's another hand. Yes. Medically, physically, emotionally relationships. Could it be that you're going through some things in relationships that have been hard? It's been a struggle. Could you raise your hand so I can pray for you too? Thank you so much. And grief. Of course, we've all experienced grief this past year and been experiencing it lately too. And so if you've been going through grief, I want you to know God knows your heart. And we can have the comfort of love that only the Lord can give through the Holy Spirit. That comfort of love that he can give us to be able to make it through. Let's bow now in prayer and just pray. Father, we thank you for these that raised their hands. Many hands were raised. Father, we just pray that you help those that need to come to you as your Savior. Help them to do that before it's too late. And Father, I pray for these that are struggling. These that need your help right now in life. And it might seem like a lonely place they're in. It might seem like a wilderness where they're not connected and, and things aren't working out the way they'd like to see it. And that your purpose is not easily seen. Father, help them to know that you're right there for them. You never left them. You're right there. Help them, Father, to see your evidence that they should be able to see it like your word says that you can do that new thing that you want to do and these that are struggling financially physically medically emotionally in relationships father you know our hearts you formed us you made us you know what we're going through i pray for these that raise their hands you know them better than they know themselves help them lord to turn to you and say lord you know me you know what I'm going through. 
I'm giving these things to you. I want to trust you for your answers. I want to follow your word and advice from godly people to know the best things to do in my life right now. And now, Father, I want to thank you. If you don't know the Lord, just say, Father, I'm accepting you now. I'm accepting Jesus as my Savior. I'm professing him as my Lord and Savior, asking forgiveness for my sins, turning away from those things, and now I'm turning to Jesus as my Savior. And thank you, Father. I profess him as my Savior, and now I want to live for you. Now, if you've done some of those things today and you want to mention it to me as you're going out, you can just say, Pastor, I prayed with you about these things, and I made some decisions today. It would just thrill my heart if you did that. It would just touch me. And I won't stand there and have a long conversation with me if you don't want me to anyway. But anyway, I would appreciate it that God to know that God is working in your life. I'm just a text away. I'm on Facebook, Tony Richmond. Just find me, okay, Salina. And listen, <clears throat> share this video if you think people can get some help out of it. Share the one two weeks ago if you want to, because the word needs to go out. And if we're not going to give it out, who's going to do it? We can't just suppose somebody's going to tell somebody. Let's make sure somebody has, knows about God's word. And now, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Richard, would you ask the blessing on our service and on these people here and the word that's gone out? Can you do that? Richard Robbins, go right ahead. Put your mask on before you leave, please. Precious Lord, thank you for this day. And thank you for all you've done for us and all you've continue to do. We humbly give you praise, honor, and glory. We thank you, dear Lord, for protecting us and, and not taking your hand of protection away from us. We ask you, Lord, would you go with each and every member here? As we go to our prospective homes, to take you with us as we leave. We thank you, dear Lord, for working in our lives, and we thank you for that that new thing that you talked about doing with us. Be with us as only you can be, and do for us as only you will. For it's in your Son's precious holy name of Jesus that we pray. In the name of Jesus, Amen. Amen.